Would you get your Bibles, and this is a continuation of the message last Sunday. Sunday morning, we, we stopped about midstream in the message, but the simple title of the message is, Wait Till Your Father Gets Home. And we've been looking at Hebrews chapter 12, and, and this is not a topic that necessarily is something that we re- enjoy hearing, because it deals with the correction of God in the life of the believer. And from time to time, every person that is a child of God, will feel the sting of the hand of God upon their life. The chastisement that comes upon it. Now I want to say this. If you don't feel the sting and the chastisement of God, that's something to be gravely concerned about. Now I, I could say that maybe you stand in consistent uprightness between God and you. But if we could all be honest with ourselves, that's not always the case, is it? We're prone to wander, as the song says, prone to leave the God I love. And many times we need the correction of God in our life. The word discipline, we get the word disciple from. And if you and I are going to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ, from time to time there will be discipline in your life. Why? Well, because we still have carnality. We still have the flesh And I'll tell you right now, uh, every day, multiple times a day, I have to crucify that rotten flesh. Brother Paul talks about that. But in Hebrews chapter number 12, in verse number 3, I would like to draw your attention to a handful of verses so we can understand this topic of the chastisement of God. Look at verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied, and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he, say that word, chasteneth. And scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God deal with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are bastards, then are ye bastards and not and partakers and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. And we gave them reverence, shall we not much rather in subjection unto the Father of Spirits and live? That term that Jesus refers to, that God, God the Holy Spirit gives liberty to Paul here to write, that term bastard simply means this, you're without father. Now I'll tell you this, as a child of the world, you, real have, you have no real father. Because Satan is your father, but he is not a father. And God doesn't make a practice of chasing Chastening the devil's kids. Just like you, you don't chasten the neighbor's kids. You don't discipline your neighbor's kids. You discipline your kids. God will chasten his children. We see that. Verse number 10. For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure. This is talking about the, uh, the earthly fathers we have. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness... Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, after it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. We left off at the beginning of the message. We looked at simply this, that number one, God chastens his children. And he does it consistently. And he does it with love. And he does it with passion and care and concern. But not only that, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, he sets the example for us. Now, I I alluded to and said that the worst thing that you can do in your family is is teach your children how to be by comparing them to another sibling. Because all you're doing is you're setting up for your children to rebel and to despise you. My parents, I'm I'm the eldest of five. Now, I was a practically perfect son. So they were able... (laughs) They were able to say, why can't you be like your big brother? And you know, it's, it, it, you know, big brothers, that's what they are. They're perfect. Now, Pastor Brandenburg, I know that you, you know, you're not the big brother. 
So I only stand from a position of knowing what a big brother does. And, <laughs> oh boy, I'll just keep digging, I'll keep digging. But here, here's the contrast. God tells us and shows us an example who we ought to be following as a role model in our life. And he's none other than Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible says that we are to look at Jesus as an example. We are supposed to look at his meekness in Matthew chapter 11, verse number 29. And 29. What, is, what is meekness? Meekness is power under control. That's what meekness is. If there was ever an example of power under control, it was Jesus Christ when he was betrayed and he was ridiculed and spit upon and crucified. The epitome of meekness, that was my precious Savior. This is why you and I, when we are reviled and, and, uh, and despised upon, that's why the Bible says, turn the other cheek, that's the spirit of meekness. Amen. Number two, we are to look at his love in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. You look at that with me, would you please? Ephesians 5, verse 25, we see that Jesus Christ, he set the example when it came to the church. In Ephesians chapter 5, it says in verse number 25, Husbands, love your wives. Here's the example. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, I just want to say this has nothing to do with the message, but never, nowhere in the Bible do you see a woman commanded to love her husband. The reason is because if a woman is true to her nature, she's going to automatically love her husband, who the husband will return in love. The Bible does command the woman to submit to her husband, which we as the church ought to submit to Christ and his leadership. But Jesus has set forth the example of love. Now this love, you'll see, and there's a few different types of love, Love in the Bible that's used, you have phileo, which is a friendship love, a type of love that you have a friendship. You have eros, which is a fleshly, carnal, physical love. But then you have agape, which is an unconditional love. And this is the kind of love that your heavenly Father has towards you, but not just your heavenly Father, but Jesus, the Son of God, who has love for you. The Bible says he loved you and he gave himself for you. This is the spirit that we ought to follow after we look at his sinlessness. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, the Bible says, Be holy, for I am holy. Look at his suffering in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. We see the suffering of Jesus Christ. All these things, uh, uh, the Bible talks about that we as Christians, if, if we live godly in Christ Jesus, we will suffer persecution. And Jesus it was set forth the example that he said it is commanded of you to be suffer for his sake. Jesus expects us to suffer too. Now nobody's going to stand in line and say, I want to suffer. Nobody's standing here saying, oh, pick me, pick me. I want to suffer. But if you're a child of God, listen, and you are, you are what you ought to be, you will inevitably suffer at the hand of this world. But counted as a as a crown to wear, counted as a joy to be able to suffer for Jesus' sake. And we look at his holiness. But how do we achieve all of these things? How do we achieve this holiness? How do we achieve this, this, this love, this standard of love, or all these things? Here is the example. Look back to Hebrews now. Here is how it happens. Verse number 10. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit. What is profit? Well, it's simply this. What's good for you? Your gain, right? That's what profit is. It's gain. Anybody do business in here? Okay? You don't want, you don't want loss. You want profit. Jesus sets the example and God chastens us for our profit, for our benefit. Now, Jesus Christ, he's giving us a standard to go by. Think of it as Jesus is the target, and I've used this analogy before. But if there is no target to, to aim towards, then everybody's right in their own eyes. But Jesus is that target, and we ought to get as close to the center of that target as much as we possibly can. 
But here's what happens is, is we say, well, I'm way off target, so I'll just quit. I'm not, even on, I'm not even in the same shooting range. I'm not even close. Here's what, here's what happens. Here's how you become a better shooter. Now, I'm not standing here as a person who's, who's a dead eye, but I would like to be. But uh, there are some fellows in here, and some, probably even <laughs> ladies much better than fellows. The reason why ladies are better shot is because they don't have the ego that accompanies it. All right? You know, a guy gets up there and, <laughs> you yeah, know, look at this. <laughs> ladies, they don't have that ego. But here's how, what makes you a better shooter. Discipline. Discipline. And God wants you to be better through discipline. He disciplines you. In the old, the old adage that says, uh, you know, with our earthly fathers, you know, the old adage they say, this is going to hurt me a whole lot more than it's going to hurt you. How many of you ever believed that? <laughs> I'm like, okay, fat chance on that one. But really, in all practical practicality, that does apply to your Heavenly Father. God doesn't delight. He doesn't take pleasure in chastening His children. He doesn't relish. He doesn't joy and say, Oh, great, great. Uh, Brother Rod is, is walking out of step with me. It's time to... That's not what God does. It breaks God's heart. You think of the, the, old, the, old, the, uh, the story of the prodigal son. The, the father, I imagine, as that son come walking back covered in the muck and mire and filth of his decisions, he didn't say, oh, I told him so. <laughs> no, it broke his father's heart. And when you and I wander from the, the fellowship and, the, and the, the unity that we have with us and God, it breaks his heart. Every time we get into sin and get in the muck and mire of this world, God all along is saying, this is breaking my heart. You ought to know better. I've given you my word to show you what you ought to be. And you're breaking my heart. But all the while we live in, in uh, this, uh, this unenchanted feelings of, oh, this is just my life. I can do what I want, where I want, how I want. But not so because you're not your own. If you're saved, you are bought with a price and you become a child of God. And you've given him right to discipline you. You see, when I was born to the Tharp family, I... I understood there would be blessings in my life, but I also understood there would be discipline in my life. And I alluded to some of my personal stories in my, in my, my childhood years, my teen years, of many times I would, I would stand in my dad's room and, and I knew what was coming, but I knew that whether, whether I realized it or not, Pastor Brandenburg, that was a, a right given to me to be disciplined. It was a right, it was a privilege I never saw it that way, but until later on, because as I bore the name Tharp, which I think is next to royalty in my mind, I love my name. I love what it stands for. It, not, it used to not be something worth speaking. My ancestors used to be God-haters uh, God and, and filthy, vile men, drunkards. I mean, women abusers, but then God chastened and he he saved the Tharp family and he saved Phil Tharp and and over time God's discipline and chastening in our lives brought us to the point where we are today what happened was this people yield to chastening they gave into it and they said this is for my gain this is for my profit this is why when we see and when we hear that old adage that this is going to hurt me a whole lot more and it's going to hurt you. We know it is true because it breaks God's heart when we have to be disciplined and chastened. Now I want you to see number three. Point number three. He desires the right responses. Now I don't know about you. How many of you still have children in your home that you're rearing? Raise your hand. You still have children in your home. Okay, Listen. When we discipline our children, and there's a difference between abusing and disciplining your children. And I stand in a position. I stand in a position. I'll say this, I'll say this with a smile on my face. If, if there's ever a child abused in Trident Baptist Church, I'll be the one to call the authorities on you. You won't have to worry about anybody else. I will, fo I will follow up on that. Because I believe in protecting our little ones. I believe in protecting our children. And, and furthermore, that goes for any individual when it comes in this church. Better not harm one of these kids because you won't have to worry about the cops. I'll come after you. 
I just, you know, that's, that's just a man in me right there, okay? You'll have to forgive me. I'm still trying to mature and grow in the Lord. But listen, when I discipline and chasten our children, my wife and I's children, I desire for them to have the right responses to chastening. There's a difference in, or, yes, sir. I don't have my children bow to me. I hope you understand. I don't have my children bow to me. But I'm going to tell you this. It would be funny to think about, honestly, though. <laughs> bow to your father. <laughs> but what is that a picture of? Submission. Right. Submission. That's what this is. Look at verse number five, please. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, here is a response, despise. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. From time to time, as I alluded to, we will receive the chastening of God. We'll receive it in our devotions. We'll receive it from across this pulpit. We'll receive it from each other. I had some phone calls this past week of, of trying to help chasten some children of God. I don't stand in a position of me being the one chastening, but God uses me to chasten other people. And I tell them, you know what's right. You know you ought to be in church. You haven't been in church. You, have, you ought to be in church. You ought to be faithful to God's house. And you know what? Those things, they're not pleasant. They're not joyous, the Bible talks about. They're uncomfortable. Believe me, it's uncomfortable for me too. It's not comfortable for me to up, stand up here and preach these things because you know what? A lot of times I'm preaching to myself. I don't stand here in a position of, you know, I'm better than you and I, I don't know. Listen, we're all on equal playing ground here. I go through chastening just like you do. But we we'll receive it through circumstances in our life. I've seen in the case of some Christians that chastening of God means that just like me brings a whirlwind about them brings hardships. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of the book of, book of Proverbs. I'm going to turn there. You stay where you're at, unless you're quick at turning. Proverbs chapter, chapter 1. The Bible is using the voice of God and, and, is, and is giving it the name wisdom. And the Bible says that wisdom crieth, in verse number 20, wisdom crieth thou, and she uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse and the openings of the gates, in the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? And their scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. You know what that is? Chastening. Chastening. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you, because I have called, and ye have refused. A response of chastisement. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have said it not all my counsel. You know what that is? Chastisement. Correction. And would none of my reproof. Here's what God says. His response will be. Are you ready for this? Here's what he says. I also will laugh at your calamity. You know what that is? You know what calamity is? Hardship. Hardship. I will mock when your fear cometh. Well, this thing is pretty hard, Brother Graham. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did, did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel and they despised all my reproof. So with all those things understood, listen, with all those things understood, with the correction, the reproof, the, the, the discipline of your heavenly father and the response of you is pivotal. It's important because it determines the outcome. 
If we refuse the correction of God, if we refuse the reproof in our life, we bring hardships upon ourselves. We bring difficulties. The whirlwind, the Bible says. The Bible says, Proverbs 29, verse 1, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. God doesn't want you and I to refuse his correction. This is why he desires, and here's the point, he desires submission. You know why it's important to come to this altar after preaching or wherever you're sitting? You know what this is doing? When we sit down, we kneel down before God, you know what we're doing? We're submitting to him. It's a show of submission. But we stand there, stand there in defiance and, you know, I'm not going to move. I'm not going to bend. I'm not going to break. I'm not going he to... He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck. You know what that is? It's a hardening your neck. And all the while, you stand to be the one to pay the price for it. I stand to be the one to pay the price for it. And not just me, but all those that accompany me. All the ones that follow after me. My children, my family, this church. See, hardening yourself and your heart towards God will only stand to bring more correction in your life. We must yield to his will. We have to, because it is for our benefit. The Bible says it's for our profit. He desires, number two, he desires a right heart. Now back in Hebrews 12, verse 5, it says, Despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou rebuked of him. Don't despise it. Don't look at it and say, I'm so sick of this. I'm so tired of this. What you ought to be doing is saying, well, I'm really tired of making this mistake. I'm tired of making a fool of myself. But I am sure glad that God's not done with me. I'm sure glad that he hasn't given up on me. Because there comes a point where God says, okay, okay, you you clearly have made your point. You want no correction. You want no. So here's what's going to happen. God will either take you and he'll put you on a shelf and be done with you, or he'll say, time to come home. Serious business. It could mean that you check out early. Now, that's at the discretion of your Heavenly Father, but I'm going to tell you, I've seen it happen. Christians who live in defiance to God, open open sin, God says, I'm going to bring correction into your life. And they go through correction with a hardened neck and despising it all along. And they come out of the whirlwind and say, I'm not changing. And they go back into correction, back into reproof, back into exhortation, and they refuse it, and they they harden their neck. And ultimately what's going to happen is they finally say, God says, okay, you're done. But here's what God desires. He desires a right heart. But he desires closeness. He desires closeness. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. God has a plan for your life. God doesn't chasten to bring delight into his life. God doesn't chasten and discipline you because he's got nothing better to do. Because, listen, that's not the heart of God. The heart of God is this. He has a plan for your life. He cares about how you turn out. Listen, if I didn't care about my kids, I'd let them do whatever they wanted to do. I'd let them wear whatever they wanted to wear. I'd let them talk however I wanted them to talk. But because I care about my children, I'm going to discipline. I'm going to chastise them. I'm going to care about them. That's your Heavenly Father. He cares about you. The reason why you felt no chastisement in the world because you didn't have a father who cared about you. Now, I work in the public school system, and I see hundreds and hundreds of kids every single day. I'm going to tell you, I see some kids whose parents care a lot about them, care how about they address authority, care about how they look. They don't walk out like, you know, like they're selling something. They care about how their child is presented. But then I see the parents 
who let their kids just do whatever they want. They, they let them dress however they want. And I, wanna, I don't want to crush their spirit. I don't want to hurt their feelings. Listen, all you're doing is you're just setting them up for destruction. You let your young man and young lady walk out uh, uh, half-dressed, you ought to have your minds checked. You ought to get some sense checked. You got to go get an MRI and figure out if there's anything between the old earlobes. I tell you, as a youth pastor for more than a decade, it just boggled my mind why Christian parents would let their kids do some of the things that they do. Listen to filthy, rotten music and dress immodestly and, and show things on their body that ought not to be shown. What is wrong with our Christian parents today? Because of no discipline. No discipline in their life. Listen, look up here and listen to this preacher. When you care about your kids, you're going to be involved in their life. You're going to pick their friends. You're right. Yes, sir. That's good. You know, I was going, I went to maximum security prisons in Chicago. I know, scary place. But I would, I would talk to a lot of those inmates, and you know what? A lot of them there for life. And I'd ask them when I develop a relationship with them, I'd say, How did you get here? Most of the time, what they'll say is, I had a friend. Is either that or booze. I had a friend. You know, Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, and he was a very subtle man. Be careful of the friends you allow your children to associate with. And can I go a step further? Be careful of who you associate with. Because your associations might bring chastisement on your life. What concord hath light with Belial? Right? What fellowship hath light with darkness? Be not unequally yoked. These are things that God says, hey, I'm choosing your friends, I'm choosing your associations. I'm developing a message about the very same thing, about kings, two kings who yoked to each other, but one had one agenda, Ahab, and the other had another agenda. Associations. Watch what your kids do. Be involved in their life. Don't, ra- don't let your kids raise themselves. Because you're the parent, they're the child. You know what's best for them. They don't know anything. I know that's hard preaching. But listen, your kids need you to be the parent. They don't need you to be their friend. You say, well, I can't tell my kids to come to church. Oh, you tell them to brush their teeth. You tell them to go to the doctor. You tell them to eat their vegetables. But my, oh, my, it would be uh, uh, just, it would be the most unfathomable thing to get them into church. Listen, if you care about your kids, you're going to bring them to church because this is what's going to bring about the, the salvation, the protection of God in their life. This is why I never got uh, messed up in the world. I never partook of the things of the world because I had some sensible parents who said, boy, you're going to be in church whether you like it or not. And you know what? It was for my benefit. It was for my profit. He desires closeness. He wants you to be close to him. I alluded to the example. When, when I would endure chastening my dad, the one thing that I looked forward to the most was that after everything was done, and I would go to my father and I would say, please forgive me. Say, I'm sorry is an emotion. Sorry is an emotion. Please forgive me is a heart of repentance. This is why I tell our children, don't say I'm sorry. You say, please forgive me. But I'd come to my dad and I'd say, Dad, please forgive me for X, Y, Z. And then my, my dad would open up his arms and say, come here, buddy. And I would bury, I'd bury my face in his chest and I would weep. And that would, my heart would be broken because I knew I broke my dad's heart. I knew that I harmed fellowship between he and I. And I would bury my face in his chest and I'd say, oh, Dad, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And he said, son, you already said to forgive me. I've already forgiven you. There's no need to say it again. Amen. You know what my dad was being? He was being the representation of God in my life. He was saying, it's all right. Correction brings about closeness. Correction brings about that embrace. You see, things are challenging and difficult and, and harsh when correction is there because it's not pleasant. But what is pleasant when your Heavenly Father embraces you? Listen, 
your heavenly father embraces you and says, son, daughter, it's okay. I love you. I care about you. This is what he desires. And not only that, but it brings about restoration. Closeness brings about restoration. I alluded to the prodigal son. He received restoration upon repentance. Now, many of you know the story of prodigal son, but let me just say this. Just because he got restored doesn't mean he got redeemed of all the things that he owned. He gave it away. He sold it. He spent it. Which means the consequences of yours and my actions don't change because we get forgiveness. There's still a cost. There's still a price for your sin and mine. This is why be cautious of how you venture into life. Be cautious of how reckless you are as a Christian because there will be costs. There will be demands. The prodigal son, he received unconditional forgiveness. He said, the father said, my son was, was lost and now was found. He said, my son was dead and is now alive. He says, he's back. He was, his, his identity was restored as a son again. The, the son said, make me, I am no worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. The father overlooked that and said, no, 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 no. You're my son. You were born into my family. You were there by right. And you'll be there as reinstated by right. He had renewed purpose and meaning now. Before, his purpose was to feed pigs in a pig pen. But his renewed purpose now is to live in his father's house as his father's son. And there was a joyful, at the end, a joyful celebration. This is that renewed restoration. Luke 15, 6 says, And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Luke chapter 15, verse 6. Lastly, he chastens to an end. Looking at verse number 11 of chapter 12 of Hebrews. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. God says, I know. I know that this is not going to be pleasant and easy. Nobody enjoys chastening. It's not joyous. But grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Chastening isn't pleasant, but the aftermath sure is. The Bible, we look at the word chasten. And simply this, the word chasten means to correct by punishment or suffering. To purify. To prune of excess, pretense, or falsity to cause to be more humble or restrained. That's what all that is. Chastening, the Bible says, the blueness of wounds cleanseth away all evil. Sometimes, chastening brings about the bruising. Brings about the bruising. The spiritual bruising. But listen, it's going to be a quick reminder of the cost of sin. The cost of iniquity. God doesn't desire for us to go back into there. You know, I, I don't, uh, uh, you know, I, I have a dog. His name's Otto. Anybody ever seen Otto yet? He's a little Dalmatian, and uh, he's a good boy. But when I got Otto first, I, you know, I don't need your input on, on what you think about it, all right? But we lived, back in Michigan, we lived at a cross section. We lived right on a corner. The highway was 88, and we lived on Sunset Hill. And uh, we'd get traffic just come screaming up through there. Even the cops of Antrim County come flying down 88. The speed limit was 55 right at our house. But I got that new dog. And uh, for his protection, I installed one of those invisible fences. And I would put one of those collars on him. Now, how many of you know what I'm talking about, those invisible fences? Okay, good. I didn't do that to relish in the pain that it caused that dog. But chastising that dog brought about his safety. You as a parent, you need to put boundaries in your home and tell them, 
there's a consequence for when you cross this boundary. Because here's what happened. From time to time, their batteries would be dead. And they'd cross that line. They'd cross that line, and they would venture out into the road. And then I would bring that dog back, and I'd say, no, no, don't do that, bad, don't do that. I'd bring that dog back across the... You know what he'd do? He knew that something wasn't right, and so he kept going across. Kept going across. Till one day, I changed the battery. And one day, he got close to that, and lit him up. But here's what happened. That was chastening. That was for his profit. You know, nobody likes saying goodbye to a dog. You know, listen, and, and I cared about that dog. Not, not near what I care about my kids. I hope you understand that. Some, some people, <laughs> you wonder. But I care about that dog because I invested into him. I paid a price for him. I'm not just going to let that thing wander, wander off. But because I've chastened him now, because I've trained him, you know what happens? As his owner, when I walk down my subdivision, I don't have to have him on a leash. You know what I do? I snap. He's here because of discipline. And when God, all, all God has to do is, son, some people have told me, Pastor, you're snap. You know, you can hear it across the church. And I snap for Jackson and Ian. Those, both those boys, if I do two, <laughs> it's not good. But if I say, boy, and what he does, and what he's supposed to do, is come right back to me. Why? Well, one, because of chastening bring desires closeness. Two, closeness brings protection under the refuge of your heavenly Father. You see, God desires this as the end of our chastening. He desires correction. He desires us to prune our lives from that which would offend our Father, to purge that chastening, God wants you to identify those things of yourself. I'm listening, I'm almost done. Don't fall asleep on me now, come on. I need you. This is, almost, this is the important part. God wants you to take that chastening to prune yourself. To eliminate it yourself. Because it, it is much better for you to do the pruning than God to do it. It's easier. It's less painful. If you understand and identify through the preaching... God, this is where I'm standing in awe against you. I'm going to prune it. But ultimately, what God desires is humility. Humility. That's what he desires. He desires peace. He desires holiness. This is why God says, Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. What is holiness? Well, it's being godlike. That's what God says. Is that even possible, Pastor? Can we be like God? Yeah, absolutely you can. You can be holy in His characteristic. You can be holy. You can live holy. You don't have to live in the mud. You don't have to live in the muck and mire of sin. You can live holy if you choose to. Looking at verse 15. And we'll be preaching about this next, this upcoming Wednesday about this. The Bible says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, thereby many be defiled. Now, this, this fail of the grace of God, this isn't talking about that we lose the grace of God or, or lose our forgiveness of sin or lose our salvation because uh, the perverters of Scripture, they'll preach that point. That's not what this is about. What this speaks of is to turn apostate from what we knew to be true whether that be a person who's heard the preaching of the word of God and are lost, or you're a child of God who's turned away. Now, there's, there, both people can do that. A person who hears the preaching of the word of God, the Bible says in verse number, uh, verse number uh, 12, or verse, yeah, I'm losing my spot here, where the Bible says that they tasted of the word of God. We see all that. We see that they were partakers of the Holy Spirit. They were in the service. They heard the preaching of the word of God and they refused. We as Christians can do the very same thing. We can refuse the chastening of God. We can refuse the correction of God in our life. It doesn't bring about our benefit. See, the root of bitterness that you'll see there, that is a response many times of correction. I get so tired of this. 
so sick of this correction in my life, and you become embittered towards God. Listen, God didn't bring the, the, the correction in your life for nothing. It's there because of me and you. God is just being a good father and coming after you. I'll close with this simple illustration. You know, later on in the scripture, in, in, the, in the gospels, you see how Jesus is referred to as the good shepherd. And you know what the shepherd does many times is that shepherd, the, one of the tools that he has in his, in his, in his trade is a, is a staff with a hook. You've seen that. And essentially what that shepherd would do is, is that many times a sheep would wander away. That sheep would wander away and that shepherd would go looking for that sheep. And he'd come back and bring it. But if that sheep kept wandering away, what would happen is, is that shepherd would chastise that sheep and would break its legs. It would break its leg so that it would that shepherd could protect that sheep from wandering away. Because that shepherd knew what was outside of that field. Wolves. Danger. Peril. That shepherd was protecting that sheep. You say, well, that's so heinous. That's so, uh, just, how, how could a shepherd do that? Because he cares about the sheep. Listen, a broken leg can be fixed. Losing your sheep can't be, re- can't be repayable. You lose a sheep, that's it. He understood the value of that sheep. You have to understand the value that you have from your heavenly father. When he looks upon you, he paid the ultimate price for you and I. His own son. This is why God will not just let you wander away. Sometimes chastisement has to come. Sometimes we must get our legs broke so that it protects us from what happens outside of this in this world. God cares about you. The simple, the simple understanding is this. Let's not scorn the loving hand of God when he corrects. Don't scorn it. Don't hate him. I've never been the worse off after being in my father's hands. You see, because in the father's hands is a place of, correct, is, is a place of safety. His hand is a place of correction. But that same hand that corrects you is the same hand that will brush your forehead and say, it's okay, son. See, my father, when... He'd, he'd spank me, and I believe that that ought to be the, I don't believe in grounding, I don't believe in all those things. I believe in good, good old-fashioned spanking within reservation. But listen, that hand that would, as a, as a boy, would paddle my behind was the same hand that would wipe away those tears. He says, okay, buddy, it's all right. The same hand that corrects you in your life is the same hand who loves you. It's the same hand that brings you back. Don't scorn the correction of God in your life because it's for your benefit. And may I add in closing, don't wait till your father gets home for you to fix all those things. Don't wait. Don't wait till you get home and have to answer to your heavenly father why you lived in defiance to him all your life. Because one day you will stand before God and you will give an account of yourself when you get home. Take care of it now. Don't wait before. It's too late. Make sure you yield to the correcting hand of God. Let's bow our head. Let's close our eyes. and.